Is a video running yet? It is? Is it good? Okay, it is. All right, good deal. Um, I want to apologize about the outline. Uh, Catherine and Becky both pointed out to me after I sent it that I sent Sunday's outline instead of last Wednesday's outline. And so that was my mistake. I know uh, that many of you had last Wednesday's outline already, but uh, since, you know, we didn't have service because of the weather and all that, but I wanted to send it out again just in case somebody forgot or, or didn't have it anymore or whatever. So I sent it out and I sent out the wrong one. So that's that. All right. <laughs> And they, they, she, you, when they called me, I'm like, what are they talking about? And then when she explained it to me, I'm like, oh, you're kind of an idiot there, Marky. Um, <laughs> so we're going to continue in our study through the Gospel of Mark, and we're in, uh, we're in chapter 10. And before we begin our study, let's go ahead and have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I'll close this out. So let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to study your word. I pray, Father, that God, the Holy Spirit, would guide what you want me to say. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The last time we left off in Mark chapter 10, where Jesus teaches on divorce and also on having the faith of a child, uh, we learned that childlike faith is an excellent illustration of salvation faith. Uh, as we move on in Mark 10, we come to the well-known encounter between Jesus and the rich young ruler. Um, all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, all mention this, uh, this encounter. But as an introduction, actually, we're going to study that one, the rich young ruler, and also we're going to study the second part of the passage, which addresses rewards for believers. But as an introduction to the story of the rich young ruler, uh, consider the results of a recent survey is found at thechristianpost.com. It says the American Worldview Inventory 2020 survey conducted by the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University found that a majority of people who describe themselves as Christian, 52%, accept a works-oriented means to God's acceptance. The study also found that huge proportions of people associated with churches whose official doctrine says eternal salvation comes only from embracing Jesus Christ as Savior, believe that a person can qualify for heaven by being or doing good. That includes close to half of all adults associated with Pentecostal, 46%, mainline Protestant, 44%, and the evangelical churches, 41%. A much larger share of Catholics, 70%, embrace that point of view, that is, that you can do good things to get into heaven. The survey of 2,000 individuals found that one in three Americans, 33%, say that they consider themselves to be a Christian and affirm the statement that when you die, you will go to heaven only because you have placed faith in Christ as your Savior. 33% believe that. Um, I introduce these numbers to point out how many people believe being or doing good will get them into heaven. Uh, what is alarming is those stats that I just read to you come from Christian churches. This does not count other mainstream religious religions such as Islam and Judaism and all the other ones. Um, and so the message we learn from the rich young ruler is that doing or being good does not qualify a person to go to heaven. Uh, of course, times have not changed. What Jesus told this guy 2,000 years ago is still an ongoing issue to this day. Uh, fact of the matter is, you cannot do anything or be anybody good enough to get into the Lord's presence. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and read verses 17 through 31, and uh, we'll go from there. Verse 17, chapter 10 says, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. 
But at these words, he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, with, the peop- uh, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And Peter began to say to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses le- or left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children, or farms for my sake, and for the gospel's sake, but that, he, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Okay, so this section, like I said, is divided into two parts. And verses 17 through 22 speaks about salvation. And then verses uh, 23 to 31 is addressed to believers about rewards. Uh, But the encounter with the rich young ruler is found in verses 17 through 22. And we note in verse 17 that Jesus sets out on a journey. And as he's walking along, uh, along, a man ran up to him and knelt before him. In describing the man of verse 17, Luke uses the word archon, which means one invested with power and dignity, a chief, a ruler, a prince, or a magistrate. And then Matthew uses the word neonoskos, which means a young man in the prime of life. The word archon was often used for Pharisees or members of the Sanhedrin. Therefore, this man was likely a Pharisee or a member of the Sanhedrin in the prime of his life. And he says to Jesus, good teacher, in verse 17, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, He sees Jesus not as God, but only as a man. And he seeks to earn his way into heaven. What shall I do? There's the key phrase right there. Remember the statistics we read. What work can I perform to gain eternal life? And of course, this was a typical Jewish view of the day, that one could gain God's approval by doing something. And Jesus' response in verse 18, he says, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. We note that Jesus points the man to the Father. Uh, Jesus is also claiming to be God in the flesh and gives the young ruler a chance to affirm this truth. And at the same time, he's declaring that the young ruler is not good and therefore cannot earn eternal life. Compared to the good which is God, no man measures up. Why do you call me good? The honor Jesus says, I, am, uh, the, I have the good of the Father, basically, Uh, But no one is good except God alone, and here I am in front of you, God in the flesh. And so you're never going to measure up to the good that comes from God. And as he always does, as we've seen over and over and over again in this gospel, in verse 19, Jesus not only directs him to the Father, he also directs him to the Word of God. Uh, And uh, he quotes uh, some of the commandments from the Mosaic Law in verse 19, some of the Ten Commandments. Uh, Of course, the Mosaic Law was the rules for living for the Jewish people prior to the death of Christ. Of course, that has not happened yet, so they're still under the law. And note that every commandment in verse 19 that Jesus quotes speaks of outward actions. Look at it. It says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. All of those are outward actions, things that people can uh, see, uh, things a man can uh, do to keep the law. And of course, Jesus is not saying doing these things will gain eternal life. That's not what he's saying at all. Rather, he is seeking to show the young man that he is a sinner. The Ten Commandments were not meant as a means to heaven. They were meant to show men and women that they are sinners. 
As Wiest writes, we cannot be saved from sin by keeping the law. That Again, doing something. The law is a mirror that shows us how dirty we are. But the mirror cannot wash us. One purpose of the law is to bring the sinner to Christ, which is what it did in this man's case. Here he is, he's standing right in front of Jesus. So he's been brought to Christ. But the law can bring the sinner to Christ, but the law cannot make the sinner like Christ. Only grace can do that. And that's the whole point of this encounter with this guy. Here he is, he's kept these laws, he's been doing these things, uh, and here he comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, do these things, and he says, I've done these things. And then, of course, we're going to see here in just a second that Jesus has more to say. But remember what Galatians 3.24 says. It says, therefore, the law has become our tutor, or tutor, to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified, how? By faith. You see, the Ten Commandments were supposed to, uh, they, the, they were supposed to show the people, look, you can never do this perfectly all the time. It ain't going to happen. The only solution for you is to place your faith in the anointed one, the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. In verse 20, it says, and he said to him, teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth. Here we see the arrogance of this man. He has a high opinion of himself, but Jesus is about to expose him as a lawbreaker and a liar. You see, Jesus knows this man appears good on the outside, but he is dead on the inside. There has to be a change on the inside is the idea. And so we see in verse 21, Jesus says, looking at him, uh, Jesus uh, felt love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. So we note that Jesus loved him. He has compassion for him. And the man had zeal without knowledge. And love sometimes demands we be completely honest. And complete honesty means we sometimes have to say hard things. And so Jesus says, one thing you lack. Uh, By demanding he sell his possessions, Jesus is not saying, this is how to be saved. Okay, don't think that for a second. He's not saying, hey, if you go out and sell everything your own, you're good, man. You're going to come to heaven. That's not the case at all. Nor is Jesus preaching a social gospel. He's not doing that either. Rather, Jesus is indicating the young ruler has broken the 10th commandment, which states, you shall not covet. By breaking one commandment, he has broken the law. His wealth was a barrier keeping him from coming to Christ in simple childlike faith. So two things about this guy. He asks what he can do to gain eternal life, and then with his wealth, he's not willing to give it up for the cause of Christ. He holds on to both of these things. Now, there came a point in the life of the Apostle Paul where we're told in Philippians 3.3, he put no confidence in the flesh. And then Romans 7.11 says, for sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. Could it be that this rich young ruler was the Apostle Paul? Something to think about. Okay, we don't know that, but it's a possibility. It goes on to say in verse 22, but at these words he was saddened and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. In the Greek, that word grieving gives the picture of storm clouds gathering. The man walked out of the sunshine of the the Lord and into a storm. He wanted to get salvation on his terms, and he was disappointed. Therefore, we see in this young man Jesus' response to doing or earning salvation. It is absolutely impossible. If you will, or if you can just listen, whatever you want to do, turn over to the uh, next gospel over, or actually uh, not the next one. Go to the gospel of John, the last one. And I want us to read a couple of verses in, in uh, chapter, uh, chapter 6. <clears throat> Talking about this idea of doing and working and all these things and earning salvation. What did Jesus have to say? John chapter 6. Here, here he's, been, he's been conversing with, uh, with the Jewish leadership. John chapter 6. Read with me verses 26 through 29. Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
You seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves of bread and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall, here it is, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Again, what shall we do to gain God's approval? And what does Jesus say? Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Can't get much clearer than that. If, if you want to do something for God, if you want to work, believe in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. You can't work it. There's nothing you can do. All you can do, sinner, is believe in Jesus Christ. We don't confess our sins. We don't walk the sinner's aisle. We don't pray the sinner's prayer. We don't get baptized. We don't do any of those things. We believe in Jesus Christ. It's clear as, 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 as day right here. Okay, so I wanted to take you there and show you that, that if you want to do uh, work for God, then believe in the Son. It's real simple. Okay, let's go back to Mark's gospel. And let's continue. We're, we're uh, in, uh, so now, okay, so the, the, the rich young man, he's now, he, he's left the scene. He's gone away, disappointed. The storm clouds of his life are, are now gathering, and he's, he's parted ways with the Lord. And so Jesus carries on the conversation, beginning in verse 23, with the disciples. And so in verses 23 through 27, uh, Jesus tells the disciples that eternal life is a free gift from God. Look at verse 23. He says, and Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible but not with God, for all things are possible with God. You see, salvation is impossible to attain by any other means than faith. The young man's money and wealth blinded him to the simplicity, the childlike faith of the gospel. Faith requires acknowledgement of our total helplessness before God. Wealth can be a distraction that deceives men to believe that their wealth is a means of acceptance before God. And of course, this was a common belief in Jesus' day. That guy's got a lot of money. He must be right with God. And it's the same way today with a lot of people. That guy, he's got a lot of money. Uh, he's a really nice guy. He, he, never, he doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He, he, man, he must be good to go. He must be good with God. And the, simple, the fact of the matter is, nothing can be further from the truth. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with wealth. Not a thing wrong with it. If you're a billionaire, great, okay? The problem comes when people, when wealth becomes the master. And to quote Weist again, he says, money is a marvelous servant, but a terrible master. If you possess money, be grateful and use it for God's glory. But if money possesses you, beware. It is good to have things that money can buy, provided you don't lose the things that money cannot buy. So it's simply a matter of having the proper attitude when it comes to wealth. Or wealth. Now, in verse, um, uh, was, uh, verse 25, he says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Gene Cunningham, on this verse, he writes this. He says, Some suggest that this refers to a small gate in the wall of Jerusalem that a camel could only enter by crawling through. This is a statement of human arrogance, which declares that if we try really hard, we can enter eternal life through our works. If I try really hard, I'm on that camel, and I know that camel can bend down. And there's a literal gate there, by the way, in Jerusalem, where, or there was at this time anyway, where camels could get through, but they had to crawl through and they had to really work at it. And so their master who was getting them through had to really work at it. You can see in the picture, okay? And that's not what Jesus is saying at all. Jesus is referring to a literal needle. It would be absolutely impossible for a camel to crawl through the eye of a needle. That's what the Lord's saying here. So also, it is absolutely impossible 
to gain eternal life through riches or by doing good things for God. It ain't going to happen. And remember again those stats that I read to you at the beginning this morning, a while ago. That was 2020. There's still people in Christian churches who think that if they do good things, they're good with God. It absolutely amazes me. And it's simply not true, and Jesus proves it uh, right here. And then note what the disciples do. In verse 26, they were even more astonished. Uh, see, this shows the common belief that everybody had at the, in those days that rich people had it made with God. And so this, the disciples we see are still struggling with the words of Jesus regarding the simplicity of faith. And in verse 27, Jesus' response he says, looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Jesus tells them, what is impossible with men is completely possible with God. All things are possible with God. But we must keep in mind the context of this passage. We're still talking about salvation here, okay? He is not saying, Jesus is not saying with God, we can do things that are physically or mentally impossible, okay? People sometimes take this verse and they think, they think well, man, I can go out and do anything because God, it's, it's, you know, God can do anything. Of course he can. But this doesn't mean that God gives us the ability to do things that are crazy like throwing a car or something ridiculous like that. I've seen people go that far with this verse. But we got to remember the context. It's talking about salvation. And Jesus is saying, that what is impossible for men, that is getting to God, namely entering heaven by wealth or good works, is possible with God. Why is it possible? Because God did the impossible when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the world, who was the sinless savior, all right? And and of course, he was resurrected on the third day. All things that are way out of our purview, folks, God was able to do it. So what was impossible for us is possible with God, referring to salvation. And the only requirement for us, we just read it a minute ago, is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with simple, childlike faith. Okay, so here is where he is done speaking about salvation. And then the conversation between him and the disciples shifts to another subject. And so that verses 28 through 31, no longer is he talking about unbelievers. And now he begins to address believers and rewards. In verse 28 says, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, excuse me, and the last first. Here Jesus teaches the disciples that eternal reward is something gained through faithfulness, that temporal rewards are things that are gained through faithfulness. Salvation is gained by faith alone and Christ alone, a one-time deal, one-time act. Rewards are gained by consistent faithfulness to Christ. So one is faith, a one-time act, salvation. Rewards is an ongoing thing of faithfulness to God. So there's a difference here, and we need to understand that distinction. Uh, And of course, what he's saying to them then obviously applies to us now. Jesus has told them that it is impossible for a person to enter heaven by wealth or works. And the disciples have been raised since childhood believing that wealth was the key to entering heaven. And by his declaration in verse 25, Jesus has blown that false teaching apart. So Peter states what he does in verse 28. His point being that he and the disciples have done what the rich young ruler did not, okay? We gave up everything for you. Matthew puts it like this. Matthew 19, 27 says, Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? Okay? We did that. 
And they're looking at that guy's walking away, and, they, and, and the disciples, they're, they're looking at the Lord, and it's like, Lord, we did that. We left everything to follow you, okay? And then, and, 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 and like it says in Matthew, he says, what then will there be for us? What are we going to get out of this deal, Jesus, is the idea. You see, Peter, and by extension the disciples, is still struggling with the material aspect of things. The word left in Matthew 19, uh, 27, in the Greek, has the idea of abandonment. We, we, we have left, has the idea of abandonment. Peter is saying, we have abandoned all to follow you. And the verb is in the aorist tense, speaking of a once-for-all act. The disciples have left everything for him. And Kenneth Wiest, in his commentary, puts it like this. He sums it up really well. Peter and John left a lucrative fishing business, and Matthew, a rich source of income from his tax collector's office, to become the disciples of a poor, itinerant preacher. Peter's question was, in effect, what reward will we get for becoming poor for your sake? The spokesman for the disciples showed by his question that they were still thinking in terms of material rather than spiritual riches. And Peter's act of abandoning his preaching commission to go back to his fishing business shows that this tendency still clung to him even after the resurrection of the Lord. You remember that? Jesus is dead and gone. Don't know where he is. I'm going to go back to my fishing business. All right? And of course, Jesus shows up on the shore, and that's where he's reinstated. The fact of the matter is, they still haven't really grasped this idea of the spiritual aspect of things. So in response, Jesus stated, anyone who abandons relationships and material things for my sake will be rewarded in this life and the life to come. And in verse 29, Jesus mentions family ties and property. Remember that the Lord himself has left his home in Nazareth, leaving his mother, brothers, and sisters behind. Now, this was not abandonment as we normally apply it. Abandonment for us always has a negative connotation. But in the case of Jesus Christ, when he left his family, it was to do the will of God. This is not negative, but positive. For anyone who leaves his family or property for the cause of Christ will always meet with reward for God is good. That's what Jesus is telling us here, okay? And so this does not mean, again, that we just, you know, blow everybody off in our family or whatever. The idea is when we do something and make Jesus the priority in what we are doing, the results are always going to be good. Does that make sense? We, we, some, all of us in this room have sacrificed in some way for the cause of Christ. And beyond that, in verse 30, Jesus promises that those who leave family or friends or property for the cause of Christ will be rewarded a hundredfold. That is a 10,000% return. That's quite a big jump there. And it's interesting. Note in verse 29, Jesus mentions father. He says sisters or mother or father. In verse 30, he does not mention father father. And the reason why is because now when you make the cause of Christ your priority, your father is God in heaven. Now your father is the Lord. He is your priority. You may still have your earthly father, but the relationship with your earthly father, will, it, it can only get better, hopefully, all right? I mean, because you have so, uh, sold out uh, for the cause of Christ, and by the way, when he mentions in verse 30, when he mentions uh, brothers and sisters and mothers and children, he's talking about the church, folks. He's talking about the body of Christ. You see, when you, when you put Jesus first, you gain a bigger family. And so now we are all part of the family, the brotherhood and the sisterhood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. I, I've, I've developed relationships, me personally, with people in, in this church that are, they're just gold to me. Okay, and, 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 and again, it's because putting Christ first, Jesus says, when you do that, you will be rewarded. But notice what else he says in verse 30. He says, along with persecutions. 
Uh Uh-oh, when you live for Christ, you will suffer persecution in some sort. Some will suffer more than others. But remember, the God of this age is the enemy of Christ, and when you live for him on this world, you will face persecution. And remember what Hebrews 11, 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is what? A rewarder of those who seek him. You see, that verse sums up what Jesus is teaching. The first step is faith. Faith is what pleases God. Faith is the means of salvation. And faith in Christ means that a person believes that God is real. And then faithfulness, the daily consistent walk of the believer, will be met with reward, for he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So Hebrews eleven six summarizes what Jesus is teaching us here. It is of note that the two dominant figures in Hebrews chapter 11 are Abraham and Moses. Both men are in that chapter, which we commonly call the hall room of the, the hall of fame of faith, because both of those guys, after they were saved, were consistent their whole life to the end. And so the Lord mentions them as heroes of the faith. So there's, there, again, The reward of faithfulness are also, not only is it temporal, the increase in family, you know, the the, the body of Christ, it's also eternal. And of course, eternal rewards are promised for faithfulness to God in this life. And then finally, in verse 31, it teaches us those who are prominent and praised in this life will come behind those unknowns who suffer and serve without praise or publicity. The big preacher who preaches the word of God consistently in a gigantic church compared to the guy that just struggles along in some far off corner of the world and has it lives in a dirt hut and preaches to, you know, that guy compared to the other guy, the dude in the dirt hut's going to get the bigger reward is, is the idea. Now, of course, only God knows who's going to get what. We, we don't know that. Only God does. But the fact of the matter is, Uh, Jesus plainly teaches us, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Okay, for the remainder of the time this morning, or I keep saying this morning, this after, tonight, I want to go to Matthew chapter 20, and we're going to be here for the the rest of the time. And I want to, this kind of keeps the subject going on rewards. It's a parable that Jesus taught. Matthew chapter 20, we're going to read verses 1 through 16. Jesus says, verse 1, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one one hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those who hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to them, to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this man last the same as to you. Uh, it is not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is uh, with what is my, or is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own, or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first, and the first last. This parable is addressed to believers. Okay, and the landowner represents the Lord. The laborers represent believers. This parable has nothing to do with salvation. The penny, a denarius, was a day's wages at that time. 
And this does not represent salvation, for nobody works for his salvation. It has nothing to do with economics, nor is the parable talking about rewards. We do not all, we do not all receive the same rewards. Some will receive more than others. And in the Christian life, the only time there is a level playing field is at salvation. After that, we all run our race. But it is not a competitive race. We do not serve with the desire to gain more than someone else, which is what these la- this first group of laborers is doing. We serve out of love for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3.8 says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. The parable, this one, is emphasizing a right attitude in service. A right attitude in service. It is important to note that there were actually two kinds of workers hired that day. Those who wanted a contract and agreed to work for a penny a day, and those who had no contract and agreed to take whatever the owner thought was right. The first laborers that he hired insisted on a contract. Look at verse 2. When, when he had agreed, that word agreed is the contract. This is the first ones he hired early in the day. Okay, so the sun comes up, these guys show up, and they agree, make a contract on one penny a day. Note then in verse 3, there's the group that comes at the third hour, and then verse 5, the sixth and the ninth hour, that's the next two groups, and finally verse 6, the eleventh hour. These are the other groups that he has hired. None of these dudes signed a contract. They all just showed up to work, and well, yeah, we'll work. Okay, and so, you know, everybody works and whatnot, so, uh, uh, and then verse 4, it says, uh, uh, and to those he said, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you, okay? So the other groups, he tells them, whatever's right, that's what you're going to get. The wage they earn, who's going to determine it? The landowner is, okay? It'll be determined by him. So, Verses 8 through 13, at the end of the day, the landowner pays the laborers. He pays the last group first, verse 8, and goes in reverse order, paying the first group last. Each group gets the same amount of pay, one penny, one denarius. The first group, the ones under contract, have worked since early in the day. They are upset because they have worked the longest, yet did not get paid more. We see that in verses 11 and 12. And then in verse 13, the landowner reminds the first group that he is simply abiding by the rules of the contract. And then finally, in verses 14 through 16, the landowner makes clear that he determines how much each group gets paid. Then in verse 15, Jesus makes the point of the generosity of God. The landowner tells one of the members of the first group, the ones under contract, that he owns all the land and he is free to do with it as he wishes. And then there's that statement that Jesus says at the end of verse 15, or is your eye envious because I am generous? You see, Jesus is making the point that God is generous. If the focus is on the reward with no regard for the service, then the attitude is wrong. I'm in this, I'm going to serve Jesus because of the rewards I'm going to get. That's the only reason I'm doing it. No, no, no. That's the wrong attitude. Okay? The lesson for uh, for Christ's disciples is obvious. We should not serve him because we want to receive an expected reward, and we should not insist on knowing what we will get. God is infinitely generous and gracious and will always give us better than we deserve. So now we can understand the perils that were hidden in Peter's question, all right, in Matthew 19, 27. Okay, for one thing, we must not suppose, verse 10, they thought they would receive more, that we will get something more if we really do not deserve it. There is the danger of pride. What then will there be for us, Peter said in Matthew 19, 27, like we talked about a few minutes ago. What will be for us? This parable uh, parable warns him, how do you know you will have anything? Beware of overconfidence when it comes to the rewards God will give. For those first in their own eyes and in the eyes of others may end up last. And likewise, do not get discouraged for those who consider themselves unprofitable servants may end up first, like we see in verse 16. 
So the parable is emphasizing a right attitude in service. And since service leads to rewards, then it follows we must not make the rewards what we want. We must make serving Christ the priority. Again, it's the right attitude. Now, I want to close this out with these these points. By the way, these are all on the outline that I failed to send tonight, (laughs) the ones that came out last week, these points about rewards. Number one, do not compare yourself to others. Keep your eyes on Christ and run your race. Don't be competitive like we see in this parable, this first group. Well, I didn't, they got more than, I should get more than them. That's not fair, God, right? No, don't do that. Don't compare yourself to others. Keep your eyes on Christ and run your race. Number two, rewards come after salvation, not before. You got to be saved before you can get rewards. Number three, rewards are based on grace and the filling of the Holy Spirit. If you are not filled with the Spirit when you are serving Christ, your reward, you, they'll burn up at the Bema seat. Rewards, number four, are given at the Bema seat of Christ. Number five, the Bema seat of Christ takes place after the rapture of the church. We know that. Number six, a believer can lose rewards, but never salvation. And number seven, rewards are described as crowns. I'm going to go through this list kind of quick. Again, this is in the handout. There is the crown of Christian or reward of Christian service. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, given for faithfulness and service to Christ. There is the crown of joy. By the way, these are all eternal rewards. The crown of joy, Philippians 4, 1, given for victory over the host of Satan. The crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 8, given to believers who long for the return of Christ. If you long for the return of Christ, you will receive the crown of righteousness. There's the crown of life, James 1, 12, given for consistently enduring temptation. There's the crown of glory, 1 Peter 5, 4, uh, 1 through 4, given to pastors who faithfully teach the word of God. And then there's the crown of life, Revelation 2.10, given to those who are martyred for Christ. All right, point number eight, relying on the grace of God, which is yielding to the Holy Spirit, is the only way to obtain rewards. Grace and the Holy Spirit. Number nine, self-effort or trying to earn a reward is the opposite of grace. Self-effort will burn at the Bema seat. And finally, number 10, length of service is not what matters. Attitude in service is what matters, and that's the emphasis of this parable. Note what it says still in Matthew chapter 20 in verse 3 and verse 6. It describes the groups as standing idle and standing around. Even though they initially were doing nothing, they did at some point go to work. And so just the the first group worked the longest, and we could call the first group Christian or believer A. He's been a believer for 40 years, and we could call believer B one of the members of the other groups. He's been a believer for three years, okay? Believer A, the one who's been doing it, has been, say, for 40 years, has spent most of his Christian life serving with the wrong attitude of service. And then believer B, who's only been a believer for three years, has spent his short Christian life with the right attitude of service. Who will receive more reward at the Bema seat? Believer B, because he has relied on the grace of God and has yielded to the Spirit more often than believer A. Now, obviously, folks, only God knows these things. There's no way that we can sit here and look at each other and say, yeah, I I think he's going to get this or that. Don't even try that. That's all God's territory. But what we know from these parables and the things that Jesus has said to the disciples, the key to the whole thing is, number one, faithfulness to Christ after salvation, and number two, being yielded to the Spirit consistently by the grace of God. And these will lead to rewards in both uh, on, in the here and now and also in eternity. Okay, uh, that's all I have for tonight. <clears throat> we'll pick it up next time back at Mark uh, chapter 10, and we'll go on from there. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to study your word tonight. I thank you for the provision of your word. I thank you, Lord, for the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I pray, Lord, that you keep us all safe tonight as the, as the weather comes through. And I thank you, Lord, for this church and what this body of Christ means to me. 
And I just look forward to uh, meeting together again soon. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>